chapter three of the red man's continent by ellsworth huntington this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the geographic provinces of north america the four great physical divisions of north america the laurentian highland the appalachian highland the plains and the western cordillera are strikingly different in form and structure the laurentian highland presents a monotonous waste of rough hills irregular valleys picturesque lakes and crooked rivers most of it is thinly clothed with pine trees and bushes such as the blueberry and the huckleberry yet everywhere the ancient rock crops out no one can travel there without becoming tiresomely familiar with fine-grained shattered schists coarse granites and their curiously banded relatives the nieces this rocky highland stretches from a little north of the st lawrence river to hudson bay around which it laps in the form of a v and so is known as the archean v or shield everywhere this oldest part of the western hemisphere presents unmistakable signs of great age the schists by their fine crumpling and scaly flakes of mineral show that they were formed deep in the bowels of the earth for only there could they be subjected to the enormous pressure needed to transform their minerals into sheets as thin as paper the coarse granites and gneisses proclaim still more clearly that they must have originated far down in the depths of the earth their huge crystals of mica quartz hornblende feldspar and other minerals could never have been formed except under a blanket of rock which almost prevented the original magmas from cooling the thousands or tens of thousands of feet of rock which once overlay the schists and still more the granites and gneisses must have been slowly removed by erosion for there was no other way to get rid of them this process must have taken tens of millions of years and yet the whole work must have been practically completed a hundred or perhaps several hundred million years ago we know this because the self-same ancient eroded surface which is exposed in the laurentian highland is found dipping down under the oldest known fossiliferous rocks traces of that primitive land surface are found over a large part of the american continent elsewhere they are usually buried under later strata laid down when the continent sank in part below sea level only in laurentia has the land remained steadily above the reach of the ocean throughout the millions of years to-day this old old land might be as rich as many others if climate had been kind to it its soil to be sure would in many parts be sandy because of the large amount of quartz in the rocks that would be a small handicap however provided the soil were scores of feet deep like the red soil of the corresponding highland in the guiana region of south america but to-day the north american laurentia has no soil worth mentioning for some reason not yet understood this was the part of america where snow accumulated most deeply and where the largest glaciers were formed during the last great glacial period not once but many times its granite surface was shrouded for tens of thousands of years in ice a mile or more thick as the ice spread outward in almost every direction it scraped away the soil and gouged innumerable hollows in the softer parts of the underlying rock it left the laurentian highland a land of rocky ribs rising between clear lakes that fill the hollows the lakes are drained by rapid rivers which wind this way and that in hopeless confusion as they strive to move seaward over the strangely uneven surface left by the ice such a land is good for the hunter and trapper 
it is also good for the summer pleasure-seeker who would fain grow strong by paddling a canoe for the man who would make a permanent home it is a rough inscrutable region where one has need of more than most men's share of courage and persistence not only did the climate of the past cause the ice to scrape away the soil but the climate of the present is so cold that even where new soil has accumulated the farmer can scarcely make a living around the borders of the laurentian highland the ice accomplished a work quite different from the devastation of the interior one of its chief activities was the scouring of a series of vast hollows which now hold the world's largest series of lakes even the lakes of central africa cannot compare with our own great lakes and the other smaller lakes which belong to the same series these additional lakes begin in the far north with great bear lake and continue through great slave lake lake athabasca and lake winnipeg to the lake of the woods not far from lake superior all these lakes lie on the edge of the great laurentian shield where the ice crowding down from the highland to the north and east was compressed into certain already existent hollows which it widened and deepened and left as vast bowls ready to be filled with lakes south and southwest of the laurentian highland the great ice sheet proved beneficial to man there instead of leaving the rock naked as in the laurentian region it merely smoothed off many of the irregularities of the surface and covered large areas with the most fertile soil in doing this to be sure the ice cap scoured some hollows and left a vastly larger number of basins surrounded in whole or in part by glacial debris these have given rise to the innumerable lakes large and small whose beauty so enhances the charms of canada new england new york minnesota and other states they serve as reservoirs for the water supply of towns and power plants and as sources of ice and fish though they take land from agriculture they probably add to the life of the community as much in other ways as they detract in this moreover glaciation diverted countless streams from their old courses and made them flow over falls and rapids from which water power can easily be developed that is one reason why glaciated new england contains over forty per cent of all the developed water power in the united states far more important however than the glacial lakes and rivers is the fertile glacial soil it comes fresh from the original rocks and has not yet been exhausted by hundreds of thousands of years of weathering it also has the advantage of being well mixed for generally it is the product of scrapings from many kinds of rocks each of which contributes its own particular excellence to the general composition take wisconsin as an example most parts of that state have been glaciated but in the southwest there lies what is known as the driftless area because it is not covered with the drift or glacial debris which is thickly strewn over the rest of the state a comparison of otherwise similar counties lying within and without the driftless area shows an astonishing contrast in nineteen ten the average value of all the farmland in twenty counties covered with drift amounted to fifty six dollars and ninety cents per acre in six counties partly covered with drift and partly driftless the value was fifty nine dollars and eighty cents per acre while in thirteen counties in the driftless area it was only thirty three dollars and thirty cents per acre in spite of the fact that glaciation causes swamps and lakes the proportion of land cultivated in the glaciated areas is larger than in the driftless in the glaciated area sixty one per cent of the land is improved and in the driftless area only forty three point five per cent moreover even though the underlying rock and the original topography be of the same kind in both cases the average yield of crops per acre is greater where the ice has done its work 
where the country rock consists of limestone which naturally forms a rich soil the difference in favour of the glaciated area amounts to only one or two per cent where the country rock is sandy the soil is so much improved by a mixture of fertilizing limestone or even of clay and other materials that the average yield of crops per acre in the glaciated areas is a third larger than in the driftless taking everything into consideration it appears that the ancient glaciation of wisconsin increases the present agricultural output by from twenty to forty per cent upwards of ten million acres of glaciated land have already been developed in the most populous parts of the state if the average value of all products on this area is reckoned at fifteen dollars per acre and if the increased value of agricultural products due to glaciation amounts to thirty per cent then the net value of glaciation per year to the farmers of wisconsin is forty five million dollars this means about three hundred dollars for each farmer in the glaciated area wisconsin is by no means unique in ohio for instance there is also a driftless area it lies in the southeast along the ohio river the difference in the value of the farm land there and in the glaciated region is extraordinary in the driftless area the average value per acre in nineteen ten was less than twenty four dollars while in the glaciated area it was nearly sixty four dollars year by year the proportion of the population of the state in the unglaciated area is steadily decreasing the difference between the two parts of the state is not due to the underlying rock structure or to the rainfall except to a slight degree some of the difference is due to the fact that important cities such as cleveland and toledo lie on the fertile level strip of land along the lake shore but this strip itself as well as the lake owes much of its character to glaciation it appears therefore that in ohio perhaps even more than in wisconsin man prospers most in the parts where the ice has done its work we have taken wisconsin and ohio as examples but the effect of glaciation in those states does not differ materially from its effect all over southern canada and the northern united states from new england to kansas and minnesota each year the people of these regions are richer by perhaps a billion dollars because the ice scraped its way down from laurentia and spread out over the borders of the great plains on the west and of the appalachian region on the east we have considered the laurentian highland and the glaciation which centred there let us now turn to another highland only the northern part of which was glaciated the appalachian highland the second great division of north america consists of three parallel bands which extend southwestward from newfoundland and the st lawrence river to georgia and alabama the eastern and most important band consists of hills and mountains of ancient crystalline rocks somewhat resembling those of the laurentian highland but by no means so old west of this comes a broad valley eroded for the most part in the softer portions of a highly folded series of sedimentary rocks which are of great age but younger than the crystalline rocks to the east the third band is the allegheny plateau composed of almost horizontal rocks which lie so high and have been so deeply dissected that they are often called mountains the three appalachian bands by no means preserve a uniform character throughout their entire length the eastern crystalline band has its chief development in the northeast there it comprises the whole of new england and a large part of the maritime provinces of canada as well as newfoundland its broad development in new england causes that region to be one of the most clearly defined natural units of the united states ancient igneous rocks such as granite lie intricately mingled with old and highly metamorphosed sediments since some of the rocks are hard and others soft and since all have been exposed to extremely long erosion the topography of new england consists typically of irregular masses of rounded hills free from precipices 
here and there hard masses of unusually resistant rock stand up as isolated rounded heights like mount katahdin in maine they are known as monadnocks from the mountain of that name in southern new hampshire in other places larger and more irregular masses of hard rock form mountain groups like the white mountains the green mountains and the berkshires each of which is merely a great series of monadnocks in the latitude of southern new york the crystalline rocks are compressed into narrow compass and lose their mountainous character they form the irregular hills on which new york city itself is built and which make the suburbs of westchester county along the eastern hudson so diverse and beautiful to the southeast the topography of the old crystalline band becomes still less pronounced as may be seen in the rolling fertile hills around philadelphia farther south the band divides into two parts the mountains proper and the piedmont plateau the mountains begin at the blue ridge which in virginia raises its even topped heights mile after mile across the length of that state in north carolina however they lose their character as a single ridge and expand into the broad mass of the southern appalachians there mount mitchell dominates the eastern part of the american continent and is surrounded by over thirty other mountains rising to a height of at least six thousand feet the piedmont plateau which lies at the eastern foot of the blue ridge is not really a plateau but a peneplain or ancient lowland worn almost to a plain it expands to a width of one hundred miles in virginia and the carolinas and forms the part of those states where most of the larger towns are situated among its low gentle heights there rises an occasional little monadnock like chapel hill where the university of north carolina lies on a rugged eminence which strikingly recalls new england for the most part however the hills of the piedmont region are lower and more rounded than those in the neighbourhood of philadelphia the country thus formed has many advantages for it is flat enough to be used for agriculture and yet varied enough to be free from the monotony of the level plains the prolonged and broken inner valley forming the second band of the appalachians was of some importance as a highway in the days of the indians to-day the main highways of traffic touch it only to cross it as quickly as possible from lake champlain it trends straight southward in the hudson valley until the catskills have been passed then while the railroads and all the traffic go on down the gorge of the hudson to new york the valley swings off into pennsylvania past scranton wilkes bar and harrisburg there the underlying rock consists of a series of alternately hard and soft layers which have been crumpled up much as one might wrinkle a rug with one's foot the pressure involved in the process changed and hardened the rocks so much that the coal which they contain was converted into anthracite the finest coal in all the world and the only example of its kind even the famous welsh coal has not been so thoroughly hardened during a long period of erosion the tops of the folded layers were worn off to a depth of thousands of feet and the whole country was converted into an almost level plain then in the late geological period known as the early tertiary the land was lifted up again and once more erosion went on the soft rocks were thus etched away until broad valleys were formed the hard layers were left as a bewildering succession of ridges with flat tops a single ridge may double back and forth so often that the region well deserves the old indian name of the endless mountains southwestward the valley grows narrower and the ridges which break its surface become straighter everywhere they are flat-topped steep-sided and narrow while between them lie parts of the main valley floor flat and fertile here in the south even more clearly than in the north the valley is bordered on the east by the sharply upstanding range of the crystalline appalachians while on the west with equal regularity it comes to an end in an escarpment which rises to the allegheny plateau 
this plateau the third great band of the appalachians begins on the south side of the mohawk valley to the north its place is taken by the adirondacks which are an outlier of the great laurentian area of canada the fact that the outlier and the plateau are separated by the low strip of the mohawk valley makes this the one place where the highly complex appalachian system can easily be crossed if the allegheny plateau joined the adirondacks philadelphia instead of new york would be the greatest city of america where the plateau first rises on the south side of the mohawk it attains heights of four thousand feet in the catskill mountains we think of the catskills as mountains but their steep cliffs and table-topped heights show that they are really the remnants of a plateau the nearly horizontal strata of which have not yet been worn away westward from the catskills the plateau continues through central new york to western pennsylvania those who have travelled on the pennsylvania railroad may remember how the railroad climbs the escarpment at altoona farther east the train has passed alternately through gorges cut in the parallel ridges and through fertile open valleys forming the main floor of the inner valley then it winds up the long ascent of the allegheny front in a splendid horseshoe curve at the top after a short tunnel the train emerges in a wholly different country the valleys are without order or system they wind this way and that the hills are not long ridges but isolated bits left between the winding valleys here and there beds of coal blacken the surface for here we are among the rocks from which the world's largest coal supply is derived since the layers lie horizontally and have never been compressed the same material which in the inner valley has been changed to hard clean burning anthracite here remains soft and smoky in its southwestern continuation through west virginia and kentucky to tennessee the plateau maintains many of its pennsylvanian characteristics but it now rises higher and becomes more inaccessible the only habitable portions are the bottoms of the valleys but they are only wide enough to support a most scanty population between them most of the land is too rough for anything except forests hence the people who live at the bottoms of the valleys are strangely isolated they see little or nothing of the world at large or even of their neighbours the roads are so few and the trails so difficult that the farmers cannot easily take their produce to market their only recourse has been to convert their bulky corn into whisky which occupied little space in proportion to its value since the mountaineer has no other means of getting ready money it is not strange that he has become a moonshiner and has fought bitterly for what he genuinely believed to be his rights in that occupation education has not prospered on the plateau because the narrowness of the valleys causes the population to be too poor and too scattered to support schools for the same reason feuds grow up when people live by themselves they become suspicious not being used to dealing with their neighbours they suspect the motives of all but their intimate friends moreover in those deep valleys with their steep sides and their general inaccessibility laws cannot easily be enforced and therefore each family takes the law into its own hands Today, the more rugged parts of the appalachian system are chiefly important as a hindrance to communication on the atlantic slope of the old crystalline band there are great areas of gentle relief where an abundant population can dwell westward on the edges of the plateau and the plains beyond a still greater population can find a living but in the intervening space there is opportunity for only a few the great problem is to cross the mountains as easily as possible each accessible crossing place is associated with a city boston as well as new york owes much to the low mohawk hudson route but is badly handicapped because it has no easy means of crossing the eastern crystalline band
philadelphia on the other hand benefits from the fact that in its vicinity the crystallines are low and can readily be crossed even without the aid of the valleys of the delaware and scutchell rivers it is handicapped however by the allegheny escarpment at altoona even though this is lower there than farther south baltimore in the same way owes much of its growth to the easy pathways of the susquehanna on the north and the potomac on the south farther south both the crystalline band and the allegheny plateau become more difficult to traverse so that communication between the atlantic coast and the mississippi valley is reduced to small proportions happy is new york in its situation where no one of the three bands of the appalachians opposes any obstacle the plains of north america form the third of the four main physical divisions of the continent for the most part they lie between the great western cordillera on one side and the laurentian and appalachian highlands on the other yet they lap around the southern end of the appalachians and run far up the atlantic coast to new york they remained beneath the sea till a late date much later than the other three divisions they were not however covered with deep water like that of the abysmal oceans but only with shallow seas from which the land at times emerged in spite of the old belief to the contrary the continents appear to be so permanent that they have occupied practically their present positions from the remotest geological times they have moved slowly up and down however so that some parts have frequently been submerged and the plains are the parts that remained longest under water the plains of north america may be divided into four parts according to the character of their surface the atlantic coastal plain the prairies the northwestern peneplain and the southwestern high plains the atlantic coastal plain lies along the atlantic coast from new york southward to florida and alabama it also forms a great embayment up the mississippi valley as far as the ohio river and it extends along the shore of the gulf of mexico to the rio grande the chief characteristic of this atlantic and gulf coastal plain is its belted nature one layer of rocks is sandy another consists of limestone and a third of clay when uplifted and eroded each assumes its own special topography and is covered with its own special type of vegetation thus in south carolina and georgia the crystalline piedmont band of the appalachian province is bordered on the southeast by a belt of sandstone this rock is so far from the sea and has been raised so high above it that erosion has converted it into a region of gentle hills whose tops are six hundred or seven hundred feet above sea level its sandy soil is so poor that farming is difficult the hills are largely covered with pine yielding tar and turpentine farther seaward comes a broad band of younger rock which forms a clayey soil or else a yellow sandy loam these soils are so rich that splendid cotton crops can be raised and hence the region is thickly populated again there comes a belt of sand the so-called pine barrens which form a poor section about fifty miles inland from the coast finally the coastal belt itself has emerged from beneath the sea so recently and lies so nearly at sea level that it has not been greatly eroded and is still covered with numerous marshes and swamps the rich soil and the moisture are good for rice but the region is so unhealthy and so hard to drain that only small parts are inhabited elsewhere in the coastal plain this same belted character is more or less evident it has much to do with all sorts of activities from farming to politics on consulting the map showing the cotton production of the united states in nineteen fourteen one notices the two dark bands in the southeast one of them extending from the northwestern part of south carolina across georgia and alabama is due to the fertile soil of the piedmont region the other lying nearer the sea begins in north carolina and extends well into alabama before it swings around to the northwest toward the area of heavy production along the mississippi 
it is due to the fertile soil of that part of the coastal plain known as the cotton belt portions of it are called the black belt not because of the colored population but because of the darkness of the soil since this land has always been prosperous it has regularly been conservative in politics the atlantic coastal plain is by no means the only part of the united states where the fertility of the soil is the dominant fact in the life of the people because of their rich soil the prairies which extend from western ohio to the missouri river and northward into canada are fast becoming the most steadily prosperous part of america they owe their surpassing richness largely to glaciation we have already seen how the coming of the ice sheet benefited the regions on the borders of the old laurentian highland this same benefit extended over practically the whole of what are now the prairies before the advent of the ice the whole section consisted of a broadly banded coastal plain much older than that of the atlantic coast when the ice with its burden of material scraped from the hills of the north passed over the coastal plain it filled the hollows with rich new soil the icy streams that flowed out from the glaciers were full of fine sediment which they deposited over enormous flood plains during dry seasons the winds picked up this dust and spread it out still more widely forming the great banks of yellow less whose fertile soil mantles the sides of many a valley in the mississippi basin thus glaciers streams and winds laid down ten twenty fifty or even one hundred feet of the finest most fertile soil we have already seen how much the soil was improved by glaciation in wisconsin and ohio it was in the prairie states that this improvement reached a maximum the soil there is not only fine-grained and free from rocks but it consists of particles brought from widely different sources and is therefore full of all kinds of plant foods in most parts of the world a fine-grained soil is formed only after a prolonged period of weathering which leaches out many valuable chemical elements in the prairies however the soil consists largely of materials that were mechanically ground to dust by the ice without being exposed to the action of weathering thus they have reached their present resting places without the loss of any of their original plant foods when such a soil is found with a climate which is good for crops and which is also highly stimulating to man the combination is almost ideal there is some justification for those who say that the north central portion of the united states is more fortunate than any other part of the earth nowhere else unless in western europe is there such a combination of fertile soil fine climate easy communication and possibilities for manufacturing and commerce iron from that outlier of the laurentian highland which forms the peninsula of northern michigan can easily be brought by water almost to the centre of the prairie region coal in vast quantities lies directly under the surface of this region for the rock of the ancient coastal plain belongs to the same pennsylvanian series which yields most of the world's coal here man is indeed blessed with resources and opportunities scarcely equalled in any other part of the world and finds the only drawbacks to be the extremes of temperature in both winter and summer and the remoteness of the region from the sea because of the richness of their heritage and because they live safely protected from threats of foreign aggression the people who live in this part of the world are in danger of being slow to feel the currents of great world movements the western half of the plains of north america consists of two parts unlike either the atlantic coastal plain or the prairies from south dakota and nebraska northward far into canada and westward to the rocky mountains there extends an ancient peneplain worn down to gentle relief by the erosion of millions of years it is not so level as the plains farther east nor so low 
its western margin reaches heights of four or five thousand feet here and there especially on the western side it rises to the crest of a rugged escarpment where some resistant layer of rocks still holds itself up against the forces of erosion elsewhere its smooth surfaces are broken by lava capped mesas or by ridges where some ancient volcanic dike is so hard that it has not yet been worn away the soil though excellent is thinner and less fertile than in the prairies nevertheless the population might in time become as dense and prosperous as almost any in the world if only the rainfall were more abundant and good supplies of coal were not quite so far away yet in spite of these handicaps the northwestern peneplain with its vast open stretches its cattle its wheat and its opportunities is a most attractive land south of nebraska and wyoming the high plains the last of the four great divisions of the plains extend as far as western texas these like the prairies have been built up by deposits brought from other regions in this case however the deposits consist of gravel sand and silt which the rivers have gradually washed out from the rocky mountains as the rivers have changed their courses from one bed to another layer after layer has been laid down to form a vast plain like a gently sloping beach hundreds of miles wide in most places the streams are no longer building this up frequently they have carved narrow valleys hundreds of feet deep in the materials which they formerly deposited elsewhere however as in western kansas most of the country is so flat that the horizon is like that of the ocean it seems almost incredible that at heights of four or five thousand feet the plains can still be so wonderfully level when the grass is green when the spring flowers are at their best it would be hard to find a picture of greater beauty here the buffalo wandered in the days before the white man destroyed them here to-day is the great cattle region of america here is the region where the soul of man is filled with the feeling of infinite space to the student of land forms there is an ever-present contrast between those due directly to the processes which build up the earth's surface and those due to the erosive forces which destroy what the others have built in the great plains of north america two of the divisions that is the atlantic coastal plain of the southeast and the peneplain of the northwest owe their present form to the forces of erosion the other two that is the prairies and the high plains still bear the impress of the original processes of deposition and have been modified to only a slight extent by erosion a similar but greater contrast separates the mountains of eastern north america and those of the western cordillera the fourth and last of the main physical divisions of the continent in both the laurentian and the appalachian highlands the eastern mountains show no trace of the original forms produced by the faulting of the crust or by volcanic movements all the original distinctive topography has been removed what we see to-day is the product of erosion working upon rocks that were thousands of feet beneath the surface when they were brought to their present positions in the western cordillera on the contrary although much of the present form of the land is due to erosion a vast amount is due directly to so-called tectonic activities such as the breaking of the crust the pouring out of molten lavas and the bursting forth of explosive eruptions the character of these tectonic activities has differed widely in different parts of the cordillera a broad upheaval of great blocks of the earth's crust without tilting or disturbance has produced the plateaus of arizona and utah the gorges that have been rapidly cut into such uh, great upheaved blocks form part of the world's most striking scenery the grand canyon of the colorado with its tremendous platforms mesas and awe-inspiring cliffs could have been formed in no other way 
equally wonderful are some of the narrow canyons in the broadly upheaved plateaus of southern utah where the tributaries of the virgin and other rivers have cut red or white chasms thousands of feet deep and so narrow that at their bottoms perpetual twilight reigns it is a curious proof of the fallibility of human judgment that these great gorges are often cited as the most striking examples of the power of erosion wonderful as these gorges certainly are the piedmont plain or the northwestern peneplain are far more wonderful those regions had their grand canyons once upon a time but now erosion has gone so far that it has reduced the whole area to the level of the bottoms of the gorges though such a fate is in store for all the marvellous scenery of the western cordillera we have it for the present at least as one of the most stimulating panoramas of our american environment no man worthy of the name can sit on the brink of a great canyon or gaze up from the dark depths of a gorge without a sense of awe and wonder there as in few other places nature shows with unmistakable grandeur the marvellous power and certainty with which her laws work out the destiny of the universe in other parts of the great american cordillera some of the simplest and youngest mountain ridges in the world are found in southern oregon for example lava blocks had been broken and uplifted and now stand with steep fresh faces on one side and with the old surface inclining more gently on the other tilted blocks on a larger scale and much more deeply carved by erosion are found in the lofty st elias mountain of alaska where much of the erosion has been done by some of the world's greatest glaciers the western slope of the wasatch mountains facing the desert of utah is the wall of a huge fracture as is the eastern face of the sierra nevadas facing the deserts of nevada each of these great faces has been deeply eroded at the base however recent breaking and upheaval of the crust have given rise to fresh uneroded slopes some take the form of triangular facets where a series of ridges has been sliced across and lifted up by a great fault others assume the shape of terraces which sometimes continue along the base of the mountains for scores of miles in places they seem like bluffs cut by an ancient lake but suddenly they change their altitude or pass from one drainage area to another as no lake formed strand could possibly do in other parts of the cordillera mountains have been formed by a single arching of the crust without any breaking such is the case in the uinta mountains of northwestern utah and in some of the ranges of the rocky mountains in colorado the black hills of south dakota although lying out in the plains are an example of the same kind of structure and really belong to the cordillera in them the layers of the earth's crust have been bent up in the form of a great dome the dome structure to be sure has now been largely destroyed for erosion has long been active the result is that the harder strata form a series of concentric ridges while between them are ring-shaped valleys one of which is so level and unbroken that it is known to the indians as the race course in other parts of the cordillera great masses of rock have been pushed horizontally upon the tops of others in montana for example the strata of the plains have been bent down and overridden by those of the mountains these are only a few of the countless forms of breaking faulting and crumpling which have given to the cordillera an almost infinite variety of scenery the work of mountain building is still active in the western cordillera as is evident from such an event as the san francisco earthquake in the owens valley region in southern california the gravelly beaches of old lakes are rent by fissures made within a few years by earthquakes in other places fresh terraces on the sides of the valley mark the lines of recent earth movements while newly formed lakes lie in troughs at their base these owens valley movements of the crust are 
parts of the stupendous uplift which has raised the sierra nevada to heights of over fourteen thousand feet a few miles to the west along the fault line at the base of the mountains there runs for over two hundred and fifty miles the world's longest aqueduct which was built to relieve los angeles from the danger of drought it is a strange irony of fate that so delicate and so vital an artery of civilization should be forced to lie where a renewal of earthquake movements may break it at any time yet there was no other place to put it for in spite of man's growing control of nature he was forced to follow the topography of the region in which he lived and laboured on the southern side of the mojave desert a little to the east of where the los angeles aqueduct crosses the mountains in its southward course the record of an earthquake is preserved in unique fashion the steep face of a terrace is covered with trees forty or fifty years old near the base the trees are bent in peculiar fashion their lower portions stand at right angles to the steeply sloping face of the terrace but after a few feet the trunks bend upward and stand vertically clearly when these trees were young the terrace was not there then an earthquake came one block of the earth's crust was dropped down while another was raised up along the dividing line a terrace was formed the trees that happened to stand along the line were tilted and left in a slanting position on the sloping surface between the two parts of the earth's crust they saw no reason to stop growing but turning their tips toward the sky they bravely pushed upward thus they preserve in a striking way the record of this recent movement of the earth's crust volcanoes as well as earth movements have occurred on a grand scale within a few hundred years in the cordillera even where there is to-day no visible volcanic activity recent eruptions have left traces as fresh as if they had occurred but yesterday on the borders of the grand canyon of the colorado one can see not only fresh cones of volcanic ash but lava which has poured over the edges of the cliffs and hardened while in the act of flowing from orizaba and popocatepetl in mexico through mount san francisco in arizona lassen peak and mount shasta in california mount rainier with its glaciers in the cascade range of washington and mount wrangell in alaska the cordillera contains an almost unbroken chain of great volcanoes all are either active at present or have been active within very recent times in nineteen twelve my cat my near the northwestern end of the volcanic chain erupted so violently that it sent dust around the whole world the presence of the dust caused brilliant sunsets second only to those due to krakatoa in eighteen eighty three it also cut off so much sunlight that the effect was felt in measurements made by the smithsonian institution in the french provinces of north africa in earlier times throughout the length of the cordillera great masses of volcanic material were poured out to form high plateaus like those of southern mexico or of the columbia river in oregon in utah some of these have been lifted up so that heavy caps of lava now form isolated sheets topping lofty plateaus there the lowland shepherds drive their sheep in summer and live in absolute isolation for months at a time there as everywhere the cordillera bears the marks of mountains in the making while the mountains of eastern america bear the marks of those that were made when the world was young the geysers and hot springs of the yellowstone are another proof of recent volcanic activity they owe their existence to hot rocks which lie only a little way below the surface and which not long ago were molten lava the terraces and platforms built by the geysers are another evidence that the cordillera is a region where the surface of the earth is still being shaped into new forms by forces acting from within the physical features of the country are still in process of construction in spite of the importance of the constructive forces which are still building up the mountains much of the finest scenery of the cordillera is due to the destructive forces of erosion the majestic columbia canyon like others of its kind is the work of running water glaciers also have done their part 
during the glacial period the forces which control the paths of storms did not give to the cordillera region such an abundance of snow as was sifted down upon laurentia therefore no such huge continental glaciers have flowed out over millions of square miles of lower country nevertheless among the mountains themselves the ice gouged and scraped and smoothed and at its lower edges deposited great moraines its work to-day makes the cliffs and falls of the yosemite one of the world's most famous bits of scenery this scenery is young and its beauty will pass in a short time as geology counts the years for in natural scenery as in human life it is youth that makes beauty the canyons waterfalls and geysers of the cordillera share their youth with the lakes waterfalls and rapids due to recent glaciation in the east nevertheless though youth is the condition of most striking beauty maturity and old age are the condition of greatest usefulness the young cordillera with its mountains still in the making can support only a scanty population whereas the old eastern mountains with the lines of long life engraved upon every feature open their arms to man and let him live and prosper it is not enough that we should picture merely the four divisions of the land of our continent we must see how the land meets the sea in low latitudes in both the old world and the new the continents have tended to emerge farther and farther from the sea during recent geological times hence on the eastern side of both north and south america from new jersey to brazil the ocean is bordered for the most part by coastal plains uplifted from the sea only a short time ago on the mountainous western side of both continents however the sea bottom shelves downward so steeply that its emergence does not give rise to a plain but merely to a steep slope on which lie a series of old beaches several hundred and even one thousand feet above the present shore line such conditions are not favourable to human progress the coastal plains produced by uplift of the land may be fertile and may furnish happy homes for man but they do not permit ready access to the sea because they have no harbours the chief harbour of mexico at vera cruz is merely a little nick in the coastline and could never protect a great fleet even with the help of its breakwater where an enterprising city like los angeles lies on the uplifted pacific coast it must spend millions in wresting a harbour from the very jaws of the sea in high latitudes in all parts of the world the land has recently been submerged beneath the sea in some places especially those like the coasts of virginia and central california which lie in middle latitudes a recent slight submergence has succeeded a previous large emergence wherever such sinking of the land has taken place it has given rise to countless bays gulfs capes islands and fjords the ocean water has entered the valleys and has drowned their lower parts it has surrounded the bases of hills and left them as islands it has covered low valleys and has created long sounds where traffic may pass with safety even in great storms though much land has thus been lost which would be great for agriculture commerce has been wonderfully stimulated through long island sound there pass each day hundreds of boats which again and again would suffer distress and loss if they were not protected from the open sea it is no accident that of the eight largest metropolitan districts in the united states five have grown up on the shores of deep inlets which are due to the drowning of valleys nor must the value of scenery be forgotten in a survey such as this year by year we are learning that in this restless strenuous american life of ours vacations are essential we are learning too that the love of beauty is one of nature's greatest healers regions like the coast of maine and puget sound where rugged land and life-giving ocean interlock are worth untold millions because of their inspiring beauty it is indeed marvellous that in the latitude of the northern united states and southern canada so many circumstances favourable to human happiness are combined fertile soil level plains easy passage across the mountains coal iron and other metals embedded in the rocks and a stimulating climate all shower their blessings upon man
and with all these blessings goes the advantage of a coast which welcomes the mariner and brings the stimulus of foreign lands while at the same time it affords rest and inspiration to the toilers here at home End of chapter three recording by jim locke of floyd virginia chapter four of the red man's continent by ellsworth huntington this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the garment of vegetation no part of the world can be truly understood without a knowledge of its garment of vegetation for this determines not only the nature of the animal inhabitants but also the occupations of the majority of human beings although the soil has much to do with the character of vegetation climate has infinitely more it is temperature which causes the moss and lichens of the barren tundras in the far north to be replaced by orchids twining vines and mahogany trees near the equator it is rainfall which determines that vigorous forests shall grow in the appalachians in latitudes where grass lands prevail in the plains and deserts in the western cordillera forests grasslands deserts represent the three chief types of vegetation on the surface of the earth each is a response to certain well-defined conditions of climate forests demand an abundance of moisture throughout the entire season of growth where this season lasts only three months the forest is very different from where it lasts twelve but no forest can be vigorous if the ground habitually becomes dry for a considerable period during which the weather is warm enough for growth desert vegetation on the other hand which consists primarily of bushes with small drought-resistant leaves needs only a few irregular and infrequent showers in order to endure long periods of heat and drought discontinuity of moisture is the cause of deserts just as continuity is the necessary condition of forest growth grasses prevail where the climatic conditions are intermediate between those of the forest and the desert their primary requisite is a short period of fairly abundant moisture with warmth enough to ripen their seeds unlike the trees of the forest they thrive even though the wet period be only a fraction of the entire time that is warm enough for growth unlike the bushes of the desert they rarely thrive unless the ground is well soaked for at least a few weeks most people think of forests as offering far more variety than either deserts or grasslands to them grass is just grass while trees seem to possess individuality in reality however the short turfy grass of the far north differs from the four foot fronds of the bunchy sacaton grass of arizona and from the far taller tufts of the plume pampas grass much more than the pine tree differs from the palm deserts vary even more than either forests or grasslands the traveller in the arizona desert for example has been jogging across a gravelly plain studded at intervals of a few yards with little bushes a foot high the scenery is so monotonous and the noon sunshine so warm that he almost falls asleep when he wakes from his day-dream so weird are his surroundings that he thinks he must be in one of the places to which sinbad was carried by the rock the trail has entered an open forest of joshuas as the big tree yuccas are called in arizona their shaggy trunks and uncouth branches are rendered doubly unkempt by sword-like ashy yellow dead leaves that double back on the trunk but refuse to fall to the ground at a height of from twelve to twenty feet each arm of the many-branched candelabrum ends in a stiff rosette of grey-green spiky leaves as tough as hemp equally bizarre and much more imposing is a desert stand of giant suheros great fluted tree cacti thirty feet or more high in spite of their size the suharos are desert types as truly as is sagebrush in america the most widespread type of forest is the evergreen coniferous woodland of the north its pines firs spruces hemlocks and cedars which are really junipers cover most of canada together with northern new england and the region south of lakes huron and superior 
at its northern limit the forest looks thoroughly forlorn the gnarled and stunted trees are thickly studded with half-dead branches bent down by the weight of snow so that the lower ones sweep the ground while the upper look tired and discouraged from their struggle with an inclement climate farther south however the forest loses this aspect of terrific struggle in maine for example it gives a pleasant impression of comfortable prosperity wherever the trees have room to grow they are full and stocky and even where they are crowded together their slender upspringing trunks look alert and energetic the signs of death and decay indeed appear everywhere in fallen trunks dead branches and decayed masses of wood but moss and lichens twin flowers and bunch berries so quickly mantle the prostrate trees that they do not seem like tokens of weakness then too in every open space thousands of young trees bank their soft green masses so gracefully that one has an ever-present sense of pleased surprise as he comes upon this younger foliage out of the dim aisles among the bigger trees except on their southern borders the great northern forests are not good as a permanent home for man the snow lies so late in the spring and the summers are so short and cool that agriculture does not prosper as a home for the fox marten weasel beaver and many other fur-bearing animals however the coniferous forests are almost ideal that is why the hudson's bay company is one of the few great organizations which have persisted and prospered from colonial times to the present as long ago as sixteen seventy charles the second granted to prince rupert and seventeen noblemen and gentlemen a charter so sweeping that aside from their own powers of assimilation there was almost no limit to what the governor and company of adventurers of england trading into hudson's bay might acquire by seventeen forty nine nearly eighty years after the granting of the charter however the company had only four or five forts on the coast of hudson bay with about one hundred and twenty regular employees nevertheless the poor indians were so ignorant of the value of their furs and the consequent profits were so large that after canada had been ceded to great britain in seventeen sixty three a rival organization the northwest fur company of montreal was established then there began an era that was truly terrible for the indians of the northern forest in their eagerness to get the valuable furs the companies offered the indians strong liquors in an abundance that ruined the poor red man body and soul moreover the fur-bearing animals were killed not only in winter but during the breeding season many mother animals were shot and their little ones were left to die hence in a short time the wild creatures of the great northern forest were so scarce that the indians well nigh starved in spite of this slaughter of fur-bearing animals the same company still draws fat dividends from the northern forest and its furry inhabitants if the forest had been more habitable it would long ago have been occupied by settlers as have its warmer southern portions and the company would have ceased to exist aside from the regions too cold or too dry to support any vegetation whatever few parts of the world are more deadening to civilization than the forests of the far north near the northern limit of the great evergreen forest of north america wild animals are so rare that a family of hunting indians can scarcely find a living in a thousand square miles to-day the voracious maw of the daily newspaper is eating the spruce and hemlock by means of relentless saws and rattling pulp mills in the wake of the lumbermen settlers are tardily spreading northward from the more favored tracts in northern new england and southern canada nevertheless most of the evergreen forests of the north must always remain the home of wild animals and trappers a backward region in which it is easy for a great fur company to maintain a practical monopoly outliers of the pine forest extend far down into the united states the easternmost lies in part along the appalachians and in part along the coastal plain from southern new jersey to texas the coastal forest is unlike the other coniferous forests in two respects for its distribution and growth are not limited by long winters but by sandy soil which quickly becomes dry 
this drier southern pine forest lacks the beauty of its northern companion its trees are often tall and stately but they are usually much scattered and are surrounded by stretches of scanty grass there is no trace of the mossy carpet and dense copses of undergrowth that add so much to the picturesqueness of the forest farther north the unkempt half breed or indian hunter is replaced by the prosaic gatherer of turpentine as the man of the southern forest shuffles along in blue or khaki overalls and carries his buckets from tree to tree he seems a dull figure contrasted with the active northern hunter who glides swiftly and silently from trap to trap on his rawhide snowshoes yet though the southern pine forest may be less picturesque than the northern it is more useful to man in spite of its sandy soil much of this forest land is being reclaimed and all will some day probably be covered by farms two other outliers of the northern evergreen forest extend southward along the cool heights of the rocky mountains and of the pacific coast ranges of the united states in the olympic and sierra nevada ranges the most western outlier of this northern band of vegetation probably contains the most inspiring forests of the world there grow the vigorous oregon pines firs and spruces and the still more famous big trees or sequoias high on the sides of the sierra above the yuccas the live oaks and the deciduous forest of the lower slopes one meets these big trees to come upon them suddenly after a long rough tramp over the sunny lower slopes is the experience of a lifetime upward the great trees rise sheer one hundred feet without a branch the huge fluted trunks encased in soft red bark six inches or a foot thick are more impressive than the columns of the grandest cathedral it seems irreverent to speak above a whisper each tree is a new wonder one has to walk around it and study it to appreciate its enormous size where a tree chances to stand isolated so that one can see its full majesty the sense of awe is tempered by the feeling that in spite of their size the trees have a beauty all their own lifted to such heights the branches appear to be covered with masses of peculiarly soft and rounded foliage like the piled-up banks of a white cumulus cloud before a thunderstorm at the base of such a tree the eye is caught by the sharp triangular outline of one of its young progeny the lower branches sweep the ground the foliage is harsh and rough in almost no other species of trees is there such a change from comparatively ungraceful youth to a superbly beautiful old age the second great type of american forest is deciduous the trees have broad leaves quite unlike the slender needles or overlapping scales of the northern evergreens each winter such forests shed their leaves among the mountains where the frosts come suddenly the blaze of glory and brilliance of colour which herald the shedding of the leaves are surpassed in no other part of the world even the colours of the painted desert in northern arizona and the wonderful flowers of the california plains are less pleasing in the painted desert the patches of red yellow grey blue white pale green and black have a garish almost repellent appearance in california the flame-coloured acres of poppies in some places of white or yellow daisy-like flowers in others or of purple blossoms elsewhere have a softer expression than the bare soil of the desert yet they lack the delicate blending and harmony of colours which is the greatest charm of the autumn foliage in the deciduous forests even where the forests consist of such trees as birches beeches aspens or sycamores whose leaves merely turn yellow in the fall the contrast between this colour and the green tint of summer or the bare branches of winter adds a spice of variety which is lacking in other and more monotonous forests from still other points of view the deciduous forest has an almost unequal degree of variety in one place it consists of graceful little birches whose white trunks shimmering in the twilight form just the background for ghosts contrast them with the oak forest half a mile away there the sense of gracefulness gives place to a feeling of strength the lines are no longer vertical but horizontal the knotted elbows of the branches recall the keels of sturdy merchantmen of bygone days the acorns underfoot suggest food for the herds of half-wild pigs which roam among the trees in many a southern county 
of quite another type are the stately forests of the appalachians where splendid magnolia and tulip trees spread their broad limbs aloft at heights of one hundred feet or more deciduous forests grow in the well-balanced regions where summer and winter approach equality where neither is unduly long and where neither is subject to prolonged drought they extend southward from central new england the great lakes and minnesota to mississippi arkansas and eastern texas they predominate even in parts of such prairie states as michigan indiana southern illinois and southeastern missouri no part of the continent is more populous or more progressive than the regions once covered by deciduous forests in the united states nearly sixty per cent of the inhabitants live in areas reclaimed from such forests yet the area of the forests is less than a quarter of the three million square miles that make up the united states in their relation to human life the forests of america differ far more than do either grasslands or deserts in the far north as we have seen the pine forests furnish one of the least favorable environments in middle latitudes the deciduous forests go to the opposite extreme and furnish the most highly favored of the homes of man still farther southward the increasing luxuriance of the forests especially along the atlantic coast renders them less and less favorable to mankind in southern mexico and yucatan the stately equatorial rain forests the most exuberant of all types of vegetation and the most unconquerable by man makes its appearance it forms a discontinuous belt along the wet east coast and on the lower slopes of the mountains from southern yucatan to venezuela then it is interrupted by the grasslands of the orinoco but revives again in still greater magnificence in the guianas thence it stretches not only along the coast but far into the little known interior of the great amazon basin while southward it borders all the coast as far as southern brazil in the amazon basin it reaches its highest development and becomes the crowning glory of the vegetable world the most baffling obstacle to human progress except in its evil effects on man the equatorial rain forest is the antithesis of the forest of the extreme north the equatorial trees are hardwood giants broad-leaved bright-flowered and often fruit-bearing the northern trees are softwood dwarfs needle-leaved flowerless and cone-bearing the equatorial trees are often branchless for one hundred feet but spread at the top into a broad overarching canopy which shuts out the sun perpetually the northern trees form sharp little pyramids with low widely spreading branches at the base and only short twigs at the top in the equatorial forest there is almost no underbrush the animals such as monkeys snakes parrots and brilliant insects live chiefly in the lofty tree-tops in the northern forest there is almost nothing except underbrush and the foxes rabbits weasels ptarmigans and mosquitoes live close to the ground in the shelter of the branches both forests are alike however in being practically uninhabited by man each is peopled only by primitive nomadic hunters who stand at the very bottom in the scale of civilization aside from the rain forest there are two other types in tropical countries jungle and scrub the distinction between rain forest jungle and scrub is due to the amount and the season of rainfall an understanding of this distinction not only explains many things in the present condition of latin america but also in the history of pre-columbian central america forests as we have seen require that the ground be moist throughout practically the whole of the season that is warm enough for growth since the warm season lasts throughout the year within the tropics dense forests composed of uniformly large trees corresponding to our oaks maples and beeches will not thrive unless the ground is wet most of the time of course there may be no rain for a few weeks but there must be no long and regularly recurrent periods of drought smaller trees and such species as the coconut palm are much less exacting and will flourish even if there is a dry period of several months still smaller bushy species will thrive even when the rainfall lasts only two or three months 
hence where the rainy season lasts most of the year rain forest prevails where the rainy and dry seasons do not differ greatly in length tropical jungle is the dominant growth and where the rainy season is short and the dry season long the jungle degenerates into scrub or bush the relation of scrub jungle and rainforest is well illustrated in yucatan where the ancient mayas reared their stately temples on the northern coast the annual rainfall is only ten or fifteen inches and is concentrated largely in our summer months there the country is covered with scrubby bushes six to ten feet high these are beautifully green during the rainy season from june to october but later in the year lose almost all their leaves the landscape would be much like that of a thick bushy pasture in the united states at the same season were it not that in the late winter and early spring some of the bushes bear brilliant red yellow or white flowers as one goes inland from the north coast of yucatan the rainfall increases the bushes become taller and denser trees twenty feet high become numerous and many rise thirty or forty feet or even higher this is the jungle its smaller portions suggest a second growth of timber in the deciduous forests of the united states fifteen or twenty years after the cutting of the original forest but here there is much more evidence of rapid growth a few species of bushes and trees may remain green throughout the year but during the dry season most of the jungle plants lose their leaves at least in part with every mile that one advances into the more rainy interior the jungle becomes greener and fresher the density of the lower growths increases and the proportion of large trees becomes greater until finally jungle gives place to genuine forest there many of the trees remain green throughout the year they rise to heights of fifty or sixty feet even on the borders of their province and at the top form a canopy so thick that the ground is shady most of the time even in the drier part of the year when some of the leaves have fallen the rays of the sun scarcely reach the ground until nine or ten o'clock in the morning even at high noon the sunlight straggles through only in small patches long sinuous lianas often queerly braided hang down from the trees epiphytes and various parasitic growths add their strange green and red to the complex variety of vegetation young palms grow up almost in a day and block a trail which was hewn out with much labor only a few months before wherever the death of old trees forms an opening a thousand seedlings begin a fierce race to reach the light everywhere the dominant note is intensely vigorous life rapid growth and quick decay in their effect on man the three forms of tropical forest are very different in the genuine rainforest agriculture is almost impossible not only does the poor native find himself baffled in the face of nature but the white man is equally at a loss many things combine to produce this result chief among them are malaria and other tropical diseases when a few miles of railroad were being built through a strip of tropical forest along the coast of eastern guatemala it was impossible to keep the laborers more than twenty days at a time indeed unless they were sent away at the end of three weeks they were almost sure to be stricken with virulent malarial fevers from which many died an equally potent enemy of agriculture is the vegetation itself imagine the difficulty of cultivating a garden in a place where the weeds grow all the time and where many of them reach a height of ten or twenty feet in a single year perhaps there are people in the world who might cultivate such a region and raise marvellous crops but they are not the indolent people of tropical america and it is in fact doubtful whether any kind of people could live permanently in the tropical forest and retain energy enough to carry on cultivation nowhere in the world is there such steady damp heat as in the shadowy windless depths far below the lofty tops of the rain forest nowhere is there greater disinclination to work than among the people who dwell in this region consequently in the vast rain forests of the amazon basin and in similar small forests as far north as central america there are to-day practically no inhabitants except a mere handful of the poorest and most degraded people in the world yet in ancient times the northern border of the rainforest was the seat of america's most advanced civilization the explanation of this contradiction will appear later
tropical jungle borders the rain-forest all the way from southern mexico to southern brazil it treats man far better than does the rain-forest in marked contrast to its more stately neighbour it contains abundant game wild fruits ripen at almost all seasons a few banana plants and palm trees will well nigh support a family if corn is planted in a clearing the return is large in proportion to the labour so long as the population is not too dense life is so easy that there is little to stimulate progress hence although the people of the jungle are fairly numerous they have never played much part in history far more important is the role of those living in the tropical lands where scrub is the prevailing growth in our day for example few tropical lowlands are more progressive than the narrow coastal strip of northern yucatan there on the border between jungle and scrub the vegetation does not thrive sufficiently to make life easy for the chocolate-coloured natives effort is required if they would make a living yet the effort is not so great as to be beyond the capacity of the indolent people of the tropics leaving the forest let us step out into the broad breezy grasslands one would scarcely expect that a journey poleward out of the forest of northern canada would lead to an improvement in the conditions of human life yet such is the case where the growing season becomes so short that even the hardiest trees disappear grassy tundras replace the forest by furnishing food for such animals as the musk ox they are a great help to the handful of scattered indians who dwell on the northern edge of the forest in summer when the animals grow fat on the short nutritious grass the indians follow them out into the open country and hunt them vigorously for food and skins to sustain life through the long dreary winter in many cases the hunters would advance much farther into the grasslands were it not that the abundant musk oxen tempt the eskimo of the sea-coast also to leave their homes and both sides fear bloody encounters with the growth of civilization the advantage of the northern grasslands over the northern forests becomes still more apparent the domestic reindeer is beginning to replace the wild musk ox the reindeer people like the indian and eskimo hunters must be nomadic nevertheless their mode of life permits them to live in much greater numbers and on a much higher plane of civilization than the hunters since they hunt the fur-bearing animals in the neighboring forests during the winter they diminish the food supply of the hunters who dwell permanently in the forest and thus make their life still more difficult the northern forests bid fair to decline in population rather than increase in this new world of ours strange as it may seem the almost uninhabited forest regions of the far north and of the equator are probably more than twice as large as the desert areas with equally sparse population south of the tundras the grasslands have a still greater advantage over the forests in the forest region of the laurentian highland abundant snow lasts far into the spring and keeps the ground so wet and cold that no crops can be raised moreover because of the still greater abundance of snow in former times the largest of ice sheets as we have seen accumulated there during the glacial period and scraped away most of the soil the grassy plains on the contrary are favoured not only by a deep rich soil much of which was laid down by the ice but by the relative absence of snow in winter and the consequent rapidity with which the ground becomes warm in the spring hence the canadian plains from the united states boundary northward to latitude fifty seven degrees contain a prosperous agricultural population of over a million people while the far larger forested areas in the same latitudes support only a few thousand the question is often asked why in a state of nature trees are so scarce on the prairies in iowa for instance although they thrive when planted in answer we are often told that up to the middle of the nineteenth century such vast herds of buffaloes roamed the prairies that seedling trees could never get a chance to grow it is also said that prairie fires sweeping across the plains destroyed the little trees whenever they sprouted doubtless the buffaloes and the fires helped to prevent forest growth but another factor appears to be still more important all the states between the mississippi river and the rocky mountains receive much more rain in summer than in winter 
but as the soil is comparatively dry in the spring when the trees begin their growth they are handicapped they would grow if nothing else interfered with them just as peas will grow in a garden if the weeds are kept out if peas however are left uncared for the weeds gain the upper hand and there are no peas the second year if the weeds are left to contend with grass the grass in the end prevails in the eastern forest region if the grass be left to itself small trees soon spring up in its midst in half a century a field of grass goes back to forest because trees are especially favoured by the climate in the same way in the prairies grass is especially favoured for it is not weakened by the spring drought and it grows abundantly until it forms the wonderful stretches of waving green where the buffalo once grew fat moreover the fine glacial soil of the prairies is so clayey and compact that the roots of trees cannot easily penetrate it since grasses send their roots only into the more friable upper layers of soil they possess another great advantage over the trees far to the south of the prairies lie the grasslands of tropical america of which the llanos of the orinoco furnish a good example almost everywhere their plumed grasses have been left to grow undisturbed by the plough and even grazing animals are scarce these extremely flat plains are flooded for months in the rainy season from may to october and are parched in the dry season that follows as trees cannot endure such extremes grasses are the prevailing growth elsewhere the nature of the soil causes many other grassy tracts to be scattered among the tropical jungle and forest trees are at a disadvantage both in porous sandy soils where the water drains away too rapidly and in clayey soil where it is held so long that the ground is saturated for weeks or months at a time south of the tropical portion of south america the vast pampas of argentina closely resemble the north american prairies and the drier plains to the west of them grain in the east and cattle in the west are fast causing the disappearance of those great tussocks of tufted grasses eight or nine feet high which hold among grasses a position analogous to that of the big trees of california among trees of lower growth it is often said that america has no real deserts this is true in the sense that there are no regions such as are found in asia and africa where one can travel a hundred miles at a stretch and scarcely see a sign of vegetation nothing but barren gravel graceful wavy sand dunes hard wind-swept clay or still harder rock salt broken into rough blocks with upturned edges in the broader sense of the term however america has an abundance of deserts regions which bear a thin cover of bushy vegetation but are too dry for agriculture without irrigation on the north such deserts begin in southern canada where a dry region abounding in small salt lakes lies at the eastern base of the rocky mountains in the united states the deserts lie almost wholly between the sierra nevada and the rocky mountain ranges which keep out any moisture that might come from either the west or the east beginning on the north with the sagebrush plateau of southern washington the desert expands to a width of seven hundred miles in the gray sage-covered basins of nevada and utah in southern california and arizona the sagebrush gives place to smaller forms like the salt bush and the desert assumes a sterner aspect next comes the cactus desert extending from arizona far south into mexico one of the notable features of the desert is the extreme heat of certain portions close to the nevada border in southern california death valley two hundred and fifty feet below sea level is the hottest place in america there alone among the american regions familiar to the writer does one have that feeling of intense overpowering aridity which prevails so often in the deserts of arabia and central asia some years ago a weather bureau thermometer was installed in death valley at furnace creek where the only flowing water in more than a hundred miles supports a depressing little ranch there one or two white men helped by a few indians raise alfalfa which they sell at exorbitant prices to deluded prospectors searching for riches which they never find though the terrible heat ruins the health of the white men in a year or two so that they have to move away they have succeeded in keeping a thermometer record for some years 
no other properly exposed out-of-door thermometer in the united states or perhaps in the world is so familiar with a temperature of one hundred degrees fahrenheit or more during the period of not quite fifteen hundred days from the spring of nineteen eleven to may nineteen fifteen a maximum temperature of one hundred degrees fahrenheit or more was reached on five hundred and forty eight days or more than one-third of the time on july tenth nineteen thirteen the mercury rose to one hundred and thirty four degrees fahrenheit and touched the top of the tube how much higher it might have gone no one can tell that day marks the limit of temperature yet reached in this country according to official records in the summer of nineteen fourteen there was one night when the thermometer dropped only to one hundred and fourteen degrees fahrenheit having been one hundred and twenty eight degrees fahrenheit at noon the branches of a pepper tree whose roots had been freshly watered wilted as a flower wilts when broken from the stalk east and south of death valley lies the most interesting section of the american desert the so-called succulent desert of southern arizona and northern mexico there in greatest profusion grow the cacti perhaps the latest and most highly specialized of all the great families of plants there occur such strange scenes as the forests of suaros whose giant columns have already been described their beautiful crowns of large white flowers produce a fruit which is one of the mainstays of the papagos and other indians of the regions in this same region the yucca is highly developed and its tall stalks of white or greenish flowers make the desert appear like a flower garden in fact this whole desert thanks to light rains in summer as well as winter appears extraordinarily green and prosperous its fair appearance has deceived many a poor settler who has vainly tried to cultivate it farther south the deserts of america are largely confined to plateaus like those of mexico and peru or to basins sheltered on all sides from rain-bearing winds in such basins the suddenness of the transition from one type of vegetation to another is astonishing in guatemala for instance the coast is bordered by thick jungle which quickly gives place to magnificent rain forest a few miles inland this continues two or three score miles from the coast until a point is reached where mountains begin to obstruct the rain-bearing trade winds at once the rain forest gives place to jungle in a few miles jungle in its turn is replaced by scrub and shortly the scrub degenerates to mere desert bush then in another fifty miles one rises to the main plateau passing once more through scrub this time the scrub gives place to grasslands diversified by deciduous trees and pines which give the country a distinctly temperate aspect on such plateaus the chief civilization of the tropical latin american countries now centres in the past however the plateaus were far surpassed by the maya lowlands of yucatan and guatemala we are wont to think of deserts as places where the plants are a few kinds and not much crowded as a matter of fact an ordinary desert supports a much greater variety of plants than does either a forest or a prairie the reason is simple every desert contains wet spots near springs or in swamps such places abound with all sorts of water-loving plants the deserts also contain a few valleys where the larger streams keep the ground moist at all seasons in such places the variety of trees is as great as in many forests moreover almost all deserts have short periods of abundant moisture at such times the seeds of all sorts of little annual plants including grasses daisies lupines and a host of others sprout quickly and give rise to a carpet of vegetation as varied and beautiful as that of the prairie thus the desert has not only its own peculiar bushes and succulents but many of the products of vegetation in swamps grasslands and forests though much of the ground is bare in the desert the plants are actually crowded together as closely as possible the showers of such regions are usually so brief that they merely wet the surface at a depth of a foot or more the soil of many deserts never becomes moist from year's end to year's end it is useless for plants to send their roots deep down under such circumstances for they might not reach water for a hundred feet their only recourse is to spread horizontally 
the farther they spread the more water they can absorb after the scanty showers hence the plants of the desert throttle one another by extending their roots horizontally just as those in the forest kill one another by springing rapidly upward and shutting out the light vegetation whether in forests grasslands or deserts is the primary source of human sustenance without it man would perish miserably and where it is deficient he cannot rise to great heights in the scale of civilization yet strangely enough the scantiness of the vegetation of the deserts was a great help in the ascent of man only in dry regions could primitive man compete with nature in fostering the right kind of vegetation in such regions arose the nations which first practised agriculture there man became comparatively civilised while his contemporaries were still nomadic hunters in the grasslands and the forests End of chapter four recording by jim locke of floyd virginia